My name is Ben Weidman. I'm a campus pastor for a group at Penn State called Third Way Collective. We focus on peace and social justice from a faith-based perspective. And to me, mental health is a justice issue. But really, when I talk about peace and justice from a faith-based perspective, I'm talking about creating spaces for people to belong. I want to tell you tonight about two people, two good friends of mine. The first one is my friend Matt. Matt's a person who will make you feel like you belong. Matt loves good things. He loves to cook. He loves good craft beer. He loves good, well-made, steel-framed bicycles and taking adventures with them. And the cool thing about Matt is that he makes you feel like you are a part of those things when you are with him. He's great at pulling you in. Tonight, I also want to tell you about my friend Eli. Eli is LGBTQ and Christian, and those two things often don't go together. Eli makes you feel like you belong. Eli recognizes that you need to have places where you can have all of your identities present and still belong. In 2011, Matt lost his battle with cancer. In 2016, Eli lost his battle with mental health. Both of these people make me think of hope. One reason they make me think of hope is because the reason that they're no longer here has taken away my hope. Matt's cancer, Eli's suicide, took hope away from me, took hope away from their families, stole hope from them. But because both Matt and Eli created spaces for people to belong, that legacy has lived on. I think about them when I think about hope because they made me feel like I belonged. When I talked to those friends, I knew that I belonged and I knew they wanted me to create spaces for others to belong. I do what I do because of people like Matt and people like Eli. And though they're not here, they will continue to inspire me with their hope. Hope. Strength. Recovery. Voice. Peace. Hope. Strength. Recovery. Voice. Peace. Hope. Strength. Recovery. Voice. Peace. My name is Althea Hughes, and I'm here tonight to tell the story about my son, David, who died by suicide at the age of 30 in 2002 on Valentine's Day. And I found myself in such dire straits that I felt like I had lost myself. Not only had I lost my son, but I lost my spirituality, which felt to me like the ground of my being. I lost my emotional stability, and I lost 
knowing where David was. It, that, that was the most present thing for me was, I don't know where David is. The first thing I did was to know that, a lot, that the anxiety that rose up in me was because of my childhood. And so I had to deal with that anxiety in order to choose to live myself. And so I went to a psychologist and I actually saw her for 12 years before I really had worked through all of those issues that allowed me to get rid of the, have the anxiety disappear. The other thing I did was I walked because of the anxiety because I couldn't go to bed at night. I was just filled with this energy that um, I had to walk away. And I lived near the Scotia Range and so I would just go down the street and across Valley Vista and into the woods. And I would do that every morning and I would do that every evening. Fortunately, I had a dog that went with me and kept me company. And it was really in walking in the woods that I, I found a piece of myself again and that I actually found David. I had always enjoyed being in the woods and identifying wildflowers and everything that lived there I wanted to know about. And one spring day, I was walking and I saw two young hawks in the tree and I said to myself, David is in the hawk. And so I found him in nature and it was a comfort to me to know that, that he was still there and that I had a place where I knew he was. And every time I see a hawk, I say, hi, Dave. And um, it really pleases me. Spiritually, it was the hardest thing to recover. Um, I had a church that I went to and was very active in, and all of a sudden, that sense of grace and being held by a spiritual being was just gone from underneath me. And I, it was like I had to start all over again. I read all kinds of books about spirituality. I found a lot of comfort in Buddhism, in Pema Chodron, who would give me things that would help me over, overcome something that was really bothering me. Um, she would say, you know, when you're angry, step away and ask yourself, what, what's the anger all about? Where's the anger coming from? Because it really wasn't my husband that I wanted to take it out on. But so I learned how to deal with, with my emotions. I, I read a lot and um, met with groups who also studied A Course in Miracles and other um, books that reconnected me to my spirituality. And I started looking about in the community for places to go that would also be spirit, feed my sense of need for spirituality. And I can say that last um, January, there was a day when this thought came to me, it is done. And all of my anxiety and fear left me. And I knew that I had recovered a sense of knowing that there is a spiritual being in the world that I can rely on, a spiritual energy in the world, really, because that's what I think about God now. And um, I feel like for the first time in my life, I've um, become the kind of open, um, loving presence in the world that, that I've always wanted to be. Thank you. Hope. Oh. Strength. Hello. 
I'm John Michael, and I have GAD, which is um, general anxiety disorders, which is where I um, will get completely like weirded out or freaked out by like being 10 minutes late to something, or if just like if the smallest thing is out of place in a routine, and it really started to get to a point like when I was younger in like fifth grade where I just couldn't really function as a human being and my teachers saw that, my family saw that and I started to see it too and so we decided that it might be time like that I should go get help. And so after taking a few psychological tests and um, talking to people and searching around we found um, the Penn State Anxiety Clinic and I met a good friend there who was also my psychologist, and um, she taught me how to recognize what thinking traps are, and what thinking traps are is there patterns your brain will get into where you'll say, like, oh my goodness, it's all gonna go wrong, and ah! It, and you just can't function. And um, I started to recognize that, and she also taught me how to calm down from an anxiety attack, and. I started to recover at a very quick rate, and then I could also see in other people when they were having an anxiety attack, and I was able to help them as well recover. And I'm still in the recovery process, and I still have GAD, and I still like, apologize too much or wonder if I've hurt someone's feelings just by saying hi to them in the hallways, but I'm getting better, and I'm recovering, and. I would like to help other people recover as well. Oh. Strength, recovery, voice, peace. Oh. Strength, recovery, voice, peace. Oh. Strength, recovery, voice. Hello, uh, my name is Cecilia Miguel. I am a student at Penn State studying astrophysics, and I have schizophrenia. When I talk about voices and talk about the negative voices that brought me to attempting suicide on February of 2014, you would think that I would be talking about the voices that I hallucinate in my head, but I'm not. I'm talking about the voices of people around me actual people like my family and friends who told me that I should not seek medical treatment, that it would ruin our, our family medical history, that people would be scared of me, that people would uh, call me crazy, that I wouldn't be able to get a job. It is those voices that affect my life more than the voices that I hallucinate. And now I am comfortable of talking about having schizophrenia because of events like this and because of the positive voices that I've heard from people who are part of my support network. So I would like to uh, do a plea to you guys to be able to be there for people as those positive voices and let them talk about difficult topics such as schizophrenia. Schizophrenia is often shied away from in even the mental health community because it makes people feel uncomfortable. When you tell someone that you see, hear, and feel things that aren't there, they often look at you in fear. But in reality, we all see, hear, and feel things that aren't there when we're dreaming. Just because I say I hallucinate, it means that I can't turn off my nightmares even when I'm awake. So when you look at me or look at someone who has schizophrenia, be that part of that support network. Because having schizophrenia does not make me a monster. And it's time to stomp out the negative stigma towards mental health. Thank you. Oh. Strength, recovery, voice, peace. Oh. Strength, recovery, voice, peace. Hello, my name is Rebecca Heil and I am 13. I have been judged my entire life by how I dress. 
Somehow people think that because I wear skirts and heels that I shouldn't be interested in science or math or even school in general. And for a while, I started to believe them. I found myself losing interest in school just because people told me I shouldn't like it. I found myself, um, I have always loved writing. It has been something I do every day after school for almost a year now. When I write, I start to discover who I am. Every character I create has a part of me in them. I think it's impossible to write something and not to have a personal connection to it. When I wrote, I started to realize that the person I was pretending to be wasn't who I actually was. I was just playing a part. I think that many teens in this time have a hard time finding out who they are supposed to be because they're told who to be. Magazines and social media, for instance, have so many ideas of how supposed to, teens are supposed to act or dress. With my writing, I found peace in myself and who I knew I was and who I wanted to be. Realize that people will talk. They will always talk about who you are supposed to be and what they think of you. I learned that no matter what people think of you, we will always find a way to find peace. And that our passion not define us. A struggle we went through or a phase shouldn't dictate our future. Who we are as a person now should be what defines us. We as a human race are capable of change. And that means we are always changing. After we find our voice and strength, after we find our hope and recovery, we have to figure out how to be at peace. We have to find who we are, and we have to know that nothing can define us except us. I find peace in knowing that a certain stereotype shouldn't and doesn't define me. Peace is found in so many different ways, but without it, what are we? Peace is the last step to every struggle, because if we don't have peace, then are we really not struggling anymore? Find peace in who you are, because nothing defines you but yourself here and now. Oh.